Hi, this is Tzvi Rosen with another lecture in our series on the history of calculus. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss backlash. Uh, that's backlash against this initial spurt of energy following Newton and Leibniz's invention, which asks people to pause and consider whether what they're doing is really sound logically and mathematically. Okay, let's go into it. The main character in this lecture is Bishop George Berkeley. Um, so uh, Berkeley was born in 1685 in Kilkenny, Ireland. Uh, he was known primarily for philosophy. He uh, innovated the philosophy of immaterialism, the idea that objects which we see and perceive do not have an independent existence outside of our perception. Uh, he was a, a religious leader. He was appointed the Bishop of Cloyne in the Anglican Church in 1734, uh, and he died in 1753 in Oxford, England. One fun fact about uh, Berkeley is that the, the city of Berkeley, California, where I attended grad school, was actually named after him. The reason for that being that uh, he wrote this poem called On the Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America. And there's a line at the, at the end of the poem, westward the course of empire takes its way. And the founders of, of Berkeley uh, were inspired by that since they were pioneers in the west of North America. And so they called the town Berkeley, California. They, they changed the pronunciation because English is a funny language. Okay, so Berkeley, besides being a religious leader and a philosopher, he also wrote about mathematics. And uh, he wrote a couple of early works in 1707 that were primarily instructional materials to teach students basic math. But he also explored mathematical fields like optics in his essay towards a new theory of vision, as well as motion and physics in a work called De Motu. But his most famous work on math was published in 1734, and that was called The Analyst. And it has this monstrosity of a subtitle, a discourse addressed to an infidel mathematician, wherein it is examined whether the object, principles, and inferences of the modern analysis are more distinctly conceived or more evidently deduced than religious mysteries and points of faith. Okay, uh, if, if you couldn't uh, quite process that entire subtitle. Uh, hopefully the, the gist of it will become clear from the content. And uh, there are three primary points that he explores in, in this essay, The Analyst, which I'll try to illustrate here. The first is, okay, everybody's very excited about calculus, but what really is a, flux, a fluxion in the language of Newton or an infinitesimal in the language of Leibniz? Uh, so he writes, it must indeed be acknowledged that Newton used fluxions, like the scaffold of a building, as things to be laid aside or got rid of as soon as finite lines were found proportional to them. Finite here means not infinitesimal, but like actual things we can touch and describe. And what are these fluxions? The velocities of evanescent increments? And what are these same evanescent increments? They are neither finite quantities, nor quantities infinitely small, nor yet nothing. May we not call them the ghosts of departed quantities? So here is, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek cri criticism of this uh, concept of the fluxian or infinitesimal, that we, we, we're using them to get concrete results, but they're, they're as undefined and unclear as a ghost. Okay, so that, that's really the his key criticism of the calculus. But beyond that, there's a kind of a principled objection to the approach to math. Um, and he, he's basically asserting that it's not enough for a mathematical tool to work. It also needs to be built up from logical foundations. You need to start from axioms and work in a principled way. Otherwise, um, you're not really doing math. You're doing something else. And here's his quote on that. In every other science, men prove their conclusions by their principles, and not their principles by the conclusions. But if in yours you should allow yourselves this unnatural way of proceeding, 
the consequence would be that you must take up with induction and bid adieu to demonstration. I have no controversy about your conclusions, but only about your logic and method. Okay, it's not enough that your conclusions are right, which the calculus had, was already proving to everyone how, how incredibly powerful it was. Um, it, it also needs to be built up in the, in the correct way. And that's what Barclay was asserting. And finally, uh, he, he makes a dig at what he perceives to be hypocrisy of mathematician, mathematicians who are also atheists. Um, and he has this long list of questions at the, at the end of the essay. And his question 64 says whether mathematicians who are so delicate in religious points are strictly scrupulous in their own science, whether they do not submit to authority, take things upon trust, believe points inconceivable, whether they have not their mysteries, and what is more, their repugnancies and contradictions. So he's, um, he's saying to a mathematician who would dismiss religion as being uh, something that is too mysterious or too much, uh, too much dependent on trust or faith, and, and he's saying to that very mathematician, the tools of the calculus that you're using, those also seem to be built up on trust and faith in something mysterious. So, so perhaps this approach is hypocritical. Okay, so those were the three primary points uh, as I read it in uh, George Barclay's The Analyst. And so he had laid down the gauntlet and said, okay, we have a problem with the calculus. Things aren't well defined. It's not built up rigorously. And so people needed to step up and try to answer that. And the first one to do this in a serious way was Jean Laurent d'Alembert. And he was a very important mathematician. He was born in 1717 in Paris. He studied philosophy and law, but also ended up publishing in math and science. He contributed the wave equation which is sometimes known as d'Alembert's wave equation. And he also made the first proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra, though there was a, a fundamental flaw that made it incorrect. And, and uh, Gauss was the, the, uh, the first to publish a completely widely accepted uh, proof of the fundamental theorem. And together with Diderot, his huge project was writing the multi-volume Encyclopédie which I, I don't speak French, I'm sorry. Um, but this was, a, this was a huge work, which was, as it sounds, an encyclopedia. And the idea was to, um, to record the principles of enlightenment thought as how it related to the world around them. And he died in Paris in 1783. So D'Alembert's response to Berkeley, to Berkeley, though not directed at him, could be found in the article on differential in the Encyclopédie, which was published in 1754. And he wrote as follows, the assumption made concerning infinitely small quantities serves only to abbreviate and simplify the reasoning, but that the differential cal calculus does not necessarily suppose the existence of these quantities. In the differential calculus, there are really no infinitely small quantities of the first order, that actually those quantities, the differentials, are supposed to be divided by other supposedly infinitely small quantities. In this state, they do not denote either infinitely small quantities or quotients of infinitely small quantities. They are the limits of the ratio of two finite quantities. The key idea here is this word, limits, okay? We're not talking about things that are ghosts or they're, that are infinitely small or uh, impossible to pin down. We're talking about ratios of finite quantities, but we are examining the limit that they approach as you follow some sequence. Okay, this is getting a lot closer to our modern definition of a limit. Okay, if we were to restate this in modern language, this description of d'Alembert, uh, we would be saying that the derivative of y, uh, which would be written if, if we're talking about y equals f of x, derivative of y with respect to x evaluated at x equals a is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. 
Okay, and that's the modern definition of the derivative. So then we can ask the question, does D'Alembert get credit for inventing limits? Um, it seems, seems that that's what he's doing in this article. But the answer is that we, th this is generally not accepted. Not, he didn't quite invent limits because he didn't formally define them. He just described them as the quantity that the ratio approaches. And if we want to get a real rigorous definition, that, wait, that needs to wait until Cauchy in the 1800s. And he was the first to define this formally in terms of quantifiers and inequalities, things that you could rigorously check, not just talk about a vague approaching. But he was still clearly moving in the right direction. But there was another uh, person whose theory became uh, very popular in the years after D'Alembert, and, uh, and it kind of shifted the attention away from limits for a while. And that person was Joseph Louis Lagrange. Uh, he was born 1736 in Turin, Italy. You might say, why does he have a French name? Well, when he was born, he was Giuseppe Lodovico Lagrange. Um, but he eventually found his way to France. He was self-taught in mathematics, believe it or not, uh, and somehow managed to make it to the top of the mathematical world. Uh, he succeeded uh, Leonard Euler, who we discussed in uh, the previous lecture, as head of the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin in 1766. That was uh, where Euler had been during his stay in Berlin before returning to Russia. And then he moved to France in 1786. Uh, for people familiar with French history, that was a highly unstable period, uh, but somehow Lagrange was always granted uh, favor and uh, positions of honor by all of the different governments that, that came in the, in the years of the revolution and afterwards. As a mathematician and scientist, Lagrange made important contributions to the calculus of variations, group theory, physics, inventing the field of Lagrangian mechanics, and more. And he died in Paris in 1813. Now, Lagrange's idea was to redefine the derivative using power series. Okay, so forget about, uh, forget about limits, and let's just, let's, let's rediscuss everything uh, where our starting point is power series, and from there we can define what a derivative is. Okay, so this was written in his, his book Theory de Fonction Analytique in 1797. He proposed the following. We're going to approximate f of x in a neighborhood of x. So if we want to take i to be some small uh, quantity, then f of x plus i will be given as a power series in i. You start with the value at x, and then you have a linear term in i, which, with whose coefficient is p of x, and a quadratic term of i, whose coefficient is q of x, etc. So it's functions of x times powers of i. And you know, the, there's, with analytic functions, you can always expand functions in this way as power series in terms of the distance from your center point. Once you define this power series, you can just take the derivative, the first derivative of f, to be the coefficient of i, p of x. Uh, and he called this the first derived function of f of x. That's why he has the single prime mark. Lagrange was the first to use that f prime notation. And it also was the source for the word derivative. So let's see Lagrange's theory in action with the function 1 over x cubed. So the idea is we have, we want to talk about 1 over x plus i cubed, and we have f of x, so that's 1 over x cubed, plus p of x i, plus q of x i squared, etc. Okay, and now we want to figure out what this p of x is. So to solve that, we're going to 
try and isolate it. So we're going to move this 1 over x cubed to the other side, and we get 1 over x plus i cubed minus 1 over x cubed equals p of x times i plus q of x times i squared, etc. And we can factor an i out of that. So we get i times p of x plus q of x i, etc. OK. So let's reformulate this difference of fractions. So we're going to put x cubed over x cubed times x plus i cubed minus x plus i cubed divided by x cubed x plus i cubed uh, just to get everything over the same denominator. Combining these fractions, well, we would expand this using the binomial theorem to get 3x squared i plus 3xi squared plus i cubed all over x cubed x plus i cubed. And that gives us minus 3x squared i plus 3xi squared plus i cubed. And we divide that by the denominator, x cubed, x plus i cubed. The next step will be to set the following to be equal. This uh, expression from the right-hand side of the equation and this expression, which was on the left-hand side of the equation. So taking those, we'll get minus 3x squared i minus 3xi squared minus i cubed divided by x cubed x plus i cubed. And that's equal to i times p of x plus i q of x. Sorry, plus q of x i. That's how I had it before. Plus, etc. We're going to divide i on both sides of this equation to get minus 3x squared minus 3xi minus i squared all over x cubed x plus i cubed should be equal to p of x plus q of x i, etc. Now at this point, if we want to solve this equation, we note that it should be true for every value, every value of i. So this should be true for all i implies that it should be true for i equals 0. OK? So now let's plug in i equals 0 and see what happens. Well, we get minus 3x squared. The other terms vanish on top, divided by x cubed times x cubed so over x to the sixth is equal to p of x. And then the subsequent terms, all being uh, multiplied by 0, vanish. OK, and that tells us that p of x is equal to minus 3 over x to the fourth, or minus 3x to the minus 4, which is exactly what you would expect from the power rule of uh, calculus, of, of uh, differentiation. OK, so it was a bit of a longer journey, but at no point were we taking uh, taking any kind of uh, limits. We weren't um, assuming infinitesimals or fluxions or evanescent quantities or certainly any ghosts. So it seemed that this was a good approach. We could define the derivative using these power series expansions. Okay, but that leads us to a problem. And the problem comes with the following definition. An analytic function is one that can be expressed locally as a convergent power series. So what we saw is that for most values of, uh, for, for, val for non-zero values of x, 
1 over x cubed can be uh, written as a convergent power series. But the problem is that not all functions are analytic. So the, the classical example is, and this was uh, given first by Cauchy, I believe, that uh, f of x, if, uh, if we set for non-zero values, it'll be equal to e to the minus 1 over x squared. Okay, you can see that as x approaches 0, those, uh, that, that exponent becomes very large in a negative direction, meaning its exponential approaches 0. And so at 0, where the function would not be defined otherwise, we just set it to 0. Okay, and then the graph looks something like this. Oh, it should be more symmetric here. Let me make it a little more symmetric. Okay, so near zero, it looks very, very flat. Perhaps not done justice by this uh, illustration. But this function has derivatives for all values. For, for, it, has, it has meaning, it's, it has a first derivative, a second derivative, it has all derivatives. Okay, and we call that a smooth function. So f prime of 0 is equal to 0. So too is f double prime of 0. In fact, all levels of derivative here are 0. So if we were to try to expand this as a power series around 0, we would find f of x would just be equal to 0. Um, or, or rather, f of 0. Yeah, sorry. f of x would just be equal to 0. Though in the, in the language we were just using, this should be f of i equals 0. Because there would be no subsequent powers of i. Everything is multiplied by a 0 derivative. OK? So it's not always possible to represent series in this way. And so even though we have perfectly valid derivatives of this function to all order, to all orders, um, we, we wouldn't be able to get there uh, with Lagrange's power series. OK, so in conclusion, uh, the calculus spread virally through Europe after Newton and Leibniz uh, made their respective inventions, mainly because of how powerful it was. But George Berkeley, George Berkeley, I, I'm always doing this because I went to Berkeley. Uh, George Berkeley noted logical issues at, at its foundations and criticized the vague definitions of fluxions or infinitesimals, depending on the version. In response, Jean Laurent d'Alembert defined derivatives as limits, but without sufficient rigor to really uh, give it mathematical footing. And uh, subsequently, Joseph Louis Lagrange used power series to define derivatives. But this only works for analytic functions. And in the next lecture, we're going to see how uh, Augustine Louis Cauchy came in and uh, revolutionized the whole art of the calculus. Okay, thanks so much for your attention.